Hello everyone and welcome to this week's ASEAN Highlights. We start off this edition with what's going on in Thailand. The Thai Finance Minister insists to push ahead a controversial plan to create a national wealth fund. The ruling Pue Thai Party told voters during the election campaign it would set up a sovereign wealth fund saying that the country's 180 billion US dollars or 5.4 billion baht international reserve was excessive. Part of the international reserves should be allocated for higher investment return, such as for oil exploration and infrastructure projects in the ASEAN region. The plan, however, sparked opposition from the public, mainly by those who contributed to a fund collected by a revered Buddhist monk during the Asian financial crisis of 1997. Finance Minister Thirachai Puwanat Naranuban said the proposed wealth fund would not affect the monks' fund and there was a clear account statement. Thirachai said the government had been studying the creation of the fund financed by the international reserves and would later present a clear plan to garner public support. Earlier, the finance minister said he asked for help from the World Bank to study the setting up of the wealth fund and asked the Asian Development Bank to support an infrastructure fund. Under the proposal, some of the foreign reserves are channeled to the fund for high dividend investment that the government says is a better use. At present, the reserves can be invested only in low-risk investments like high-rated government bonds and gold. Akanit Wichien of Thai News Agency, ASEAN TV. And in a rare exclusive interview with Thai News Agency, Thai Foreign Minister Surapong Towichak Chaikun spoke with our reporter Panu Wong Shaum about his priorities in enhancing Thailand's position with neighboring countries and his government's push to fulfill all of Thailand's regional obligations as ASEAN moved towards the formation of the ASEAN Economic Community or AEC in 2015. In an exclusive interview with Thai news agency, the new Thai foreign minister, Surapong Towichak Chayakun, outlines the basic priorities he intends to pursue during his tenure at the ministry. Enhance the relationship between us and our neighbors, especially Cambodia. We want to live in the ASEAN and gain respect from the ASEAN country. And we will walk together, step forward together, and we would like to uh, make the ASEAN have, you know, to become the, 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 the community that the other community like EU, the other side of the world, Respect. The Thai Ministry of Foreign Affairs is expected this year to work with other ministries in continuing a range of policies ranging from the building of roads and rail links through to the establishing of legal frameworks in order to attain the goals set by the ASEAN Master Plan on Connectivity. Meanwhile, Thailand is expected to sponsor the ASEAN Comprehensive Investment Agreement with other Southeast Asian countries at the next ASEAN Leaders' Summit to be held in the Indonesian resort island of Bali later this year in November. Thailand, we are in the middle of the ASEAN community. Whatever we have the commitment in the ASEAN, we, we, we will do it because in 2015, we have the commitment that, you know, the ASEAN community will, will be happening as one, one community. So we will do everything according to the commitment or the promise that we have made together. While the new foreign minister vows to work closely with other cabinet members and parliamentarians during his tenure, questions have been raised by many critics concerning his qualification and suitability for this position. 
Some have pointed out to Surapong's close ties with former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat, anticipating that the 58-year-old MP from Chiang Mai will use his position as the foreign minister to whitewash Thaksin's criminal charges abroad and bring the former leader home. I will be service to uh, Dr. Thaksin. That's the way they're thinking, which we cannot, you know, stop them from their thinking that way. But what I'm doing here, we prove myself, you know, to, to the Thai people, that who I'm really working for. So I would like to ask people that critique on me, give me some time to do my job. And I will, won't make anybody to disappoint on me. Only time will tell how Surapong will fare in his position politically, but in terms of Thailand's foreign policy, the foreign minister said that he will need time to gain more knowledge about his jobs, and in the meantime, there will be no real radical shift in the direction of the country's international relation. Daunting tasks for Foreign Minister Surapong and Prime Minister Ying Lak will lie not in the short term, but rather in the longer road, in preparing government agencies and ordinary ties for the upcoming ASEAN economic integration in 2015 and beyond, and it remains to be seen whether this government can achieve this goal. I'm Panuk Wong Um of Thai News Agency, reporting for ASEAN TV. Then on to Cambodia. A Cambodian court on Thursday convicted a British man of sexually abusing three young girls and sentenced him to 12 years in prison. 51-year-old Michael Julian Leach was convicted in absentia. It wasn't clear why he was not present when the verdict was read. Authorities said that Leach was arrested in September last year at a guest house in Kandai province on the outskirts of the capital Phnom Penh. Police found Leach to be living with three girls aged between 10 to 15 years old. Phnom Penh Municipal Court Judge Ong Sien convicted the Briton on charges of paying to have sex with the girls and ordered him to pay 12 million real or 3,000 US dollars to each of the victims. The judge also ordered that Leach be deported from Cambodia after his jail term ends. Three Cambodian men were also convicted by the court for providing Leach with transportation and accommodation to have sex with the girls. They were each sentenced to between two to four years in prison, according to the judge. Cambodia has long been a magnet for foreign pedophiles because of poverty and poor law enforcement. In recent years, police and courts have increasingly targeted sex offenders. Also this week, Malaysia and Singapore have agreed to force close cooperation in developing the tourism industry, especially in homestay program, cruise tourism and ecotourism. Malaysia's tourism minister, Dr Ng Yen Yen, said the agreement was reached after she convened a meeting with Singapore's second minister for trade and industry, S. Iswaran, who paid a courtesy call on her at her office in Putrajaya Wednesday. For a start, Ng said Malaysia would send a team to visit schools in Singapore in a bid to promote Malaysian homestay experience and programs among the students. She said Singapore, through its education ministry, has introduced a program called Learning Journey, which provides an allocation for students aged between 13 and 16 to visit other countries. Ng noted that Singapore is also willing to share its ideas and experiences to further develop the industry of cruise tourism. The minister said the cooperation in ecotourism, on the other hand, would enable Malaysia to lure foreign tourists into Singapore, especially from Moscow, as Singapore had established direct flights with Russia. On to something lighter now. Football is a sport that commands a large following across this region and the world. And in this next story, our reporter Panu Wong Shaum caught up with Henrique Callisto, a veteran Portuguese coach who possessed more than a decade of experience in Southeast Asian football, and asked about the future of the beautiful game in ASEAN. The euphoric chant of the football faithful, the bouncing spectators on the stands, these are part of the charm of the beautiful game so loved and cherished across the world, not least right here in Southeast Asia. Although some problems like off-field hooliganism and players' discipline still persist, the standard of the game on display in the Thai Premier League, where some entertaining football are played weekly, and where the presence of international superstar like Robbie Fowler create excitement for the fans, showed how far the game has come in Thailand 
and indirectly reflects the overall development of Southeast Asian football. Enrique Calisto, the current head coach of Mueang Tong United, who had more than a decade of experience in the world of Southeast Asian football, particularly when he was in charge of the Vietnamese national team, points out to the abundance of potential that this region's footballer possess. Although he said there are some areas that need serious attentions. Their potential, they are fast, skill, because skill you can training, but the problem is the knowledge about, about the game, the tactic knowledge. This is a big problem, not physical problem, not technical problems. If you compare it with, uh, with uh, Europe, the young boys, they have competition, official competition uh, since uh, 10 years and they play a lot of games in uh, one year. And uh, in South Asia, some uh, like uh, Vietnam, the, the championship to the young team is only two months and then they're training 10 months without competition. This is not so Apart from tactical awareness and game experience, Callisto stresses that Southeast Asian footballers must be must tougher and more competitive the, the, the going into games, stressing on the importance of right mentality needed for all players. If you go to a game and if you don't believe you can win, you lose. So this, uh, the mentality in Europe is different. Also, you can have um, a lot of surprise. The weak team can defeat the, 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 the strong team because this is the mentality of the professional. You must keep this in, uh, in, in talent. Talent is a uh, friendly people and uh, come to the game like a people, friendly people. In football, you must be not friendly, fair but fighting, fair but fighting. This is uh, one question to, to develop. At the beginning of the year, some ASEAN government officials suggest that the region should bid to host the FIFA World Cup for the year 2030, providing an incentive for the enhancement of the beautiful game in Southeast Asia, as the bid would guarantee a final berth for regional teams. It is still unclear whether this ambitious move will materialize and what will the arrangement be. Nevertheless, for a seasoned veteran like Callisto, Southeast Asian football has already excelled very far in the past decade and with a little push, could even create a few surprises in the months and years to come. I'm Panu Wong Sheum of Thai News Agency, reporting for ASEAN TV. And we wrap up this edition with a story in Indonesia. Abandoned for two weeks, starving dogs in Indonesia ate their owner. Seven dogs starved of food and water for two weeks are suspected of eating their Indonesian owner after he returned home from a holiday. Local media reported on Tuesday. A neighborhood guard was curious when he saw a luggage line up at the front of Andre Lamboga's house days after the 50 year old arrived back home. He approached the house, smelled something foul, and called the police, according to the report. Eriana, a local police chief in Batam, an island off Sumatra and just south of Singapore, said the dogs ate the owner. They did not eat for 16 days when the owner went to his hometown in Manado. Lumberger arrived home last Wednesday, but his body was only discovered on Monday. Police also found the bones of two other dogs in the house, believed to have also been eaten by the hungry canines. Lumberger was from northern Sulawesi Island, a predominantly Christian area, where the local spicy diet is famous in Indonesia for including dogs, bats and forest rats. And that wraps up this week's edition of ASEAN Highlights. On behalf of everyone here at the ASEAN News Desk, we hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Sawadee